Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here with us and welcome to Getting Off Gas, Solutions for a Just Transition. But let me now introduce our first speaker for tonight. Heat, co-founder and co-executive director, Audrey Shulman. Shulman co-founded Heat in 2008. A lover of maps, she created the first in the nation statewide map of utility reported gas leaks. She started the large volume leak study, which discovered a way for gas utilities to identify super emitting gas leaks and repair them. She also initiated the research that led to the study, Home is Where the Pipeline Ends, focusing the country's attention on the health impacts of gas stoves. Together with Zainab Magavi, she has developed HEAT's in innovation solution to transition gas utilities from gas to geothermal networks, an approach that is gaining traction among utilities and state legislators nationwide. Shulman is also an author of novels which were translated into 12 languages. Due to technical difficulty, you will not hear Audrey reading her slides until slide number eight. HEAT is a nonprofit funded by foundations and donors. HEAT does not accept funding from industry, whether gas or geothermal. HEAT performs this work through a networked leadership, constantly iterating on ideas with all stakeholders to get to yes. This is a photo of HEAT's monthly charrettes where we bring stakeholders together to find problems before they happen and solve for them. Union leaders and utility executives and community activists and geothermal experts working together. HEAT is data-driven using research, data transparency, and third-party verification to check the results and disseminate the information widely. Detail of a national grid gas infrastructure map of Back Bay showing two pipes from the 1800s still in use running down Beacon Street and Com Ave. Utility reported gas leaks as of April 2023. Will not have paid it off uh, until uh, 2097, um, which is long in the future. That will be my grandkids. Um, so given all of that information, this is what happened to me. <laughs> On my street in Cambridge, uh, Eversource came along a few, two years ago and uh, they ripped up the street to, you know, and replaced the gas pipe with a new, brand new gas pipe. Uh, my street's one block long. Uh, and so two of the customers on my street have already gone off since then, gone off the gas system to air source heat pumps, right? So two, you know, so this gas new, brand new gas pipe which will last for you know, at least 100 years probably, is serving only 28 customers. At this rate, <laughs> there'll be no customers on it pretty soon. Um, and we, we will still all have to, pay, you know, all the gas customers remaining will still have to pay off this, this gas pipe. Um, and that situation is happening more all across the country. Uh, this is an American Gas Association chart showing the expenditures of gas utilities on installing new gas pipes to replace old gas pipes. And you can see there's a huge bump up in 2012 and that was because of the, uh, the San Bruno gas explosion. So uh, after that, the utilities realized <laughs> we gotta replace these old pipes. Um, and so all this money, it's over a trillion dollars across the country is going into new fossil fuel infrastructure, new methane pipes. And meanwhile, more and more people are going to heat pumps, right? Air source heat pumps are now outselling gas furnaces across the country. So what does that mean? That means that one by one, gas customers are getting off the gas infrastructure, going to air source heat pumps. Each one of these customers is uh, means that there's less customers paying into the gas system, paying for all those new gas pipes, as well as the operations and maintenance, which hasn't gotten any cheaper because the gas system's still the same size and the same cost uh, to maintain. So that means that at some point there's gonna be an inflection point hit where heating with gas will become more expensive than heating with uh, air source heat pumps. At that point, everybody who can will get off the system. The only people left on the gas system 
will be renters and low income, right? People who cannot afford uh, an air force heat pump. The Germans call this the last grandma problem where they imagine one last low income grandma left on say the entire national grid system. And uh, she will not be able to afford <laughs> taking care of the entire system. So there's probably under that you know hypothetical case, there's only gonna be one gas worker trying to take care <laughs> of the entire system. It's not gonna be safe and it's not gonna be the kind of just transition we all want, right? That's not what we want. So uh, back in 2017, understanding this, Heat came up with the concept of instead having gas utilities install thermal networks, which have also been called network geothermal, geo micro district, and a thousand other <laughs> names, but I'm gonna call it thermal networks for now. Uh, all it means is a, a water pipe in the street, going up and down the street, right? And uh, service loops of ambient temperature water going into each home or business. And in there, there'd be a heat pump that would pull temperature off of that, that water. Uh, and there'd be boreholes attached just a few hundred feet deep. Uh, and uh, the gas utility, the gas utility would install, operate and maintain it. And in a way they're perfect for it, right? Because they've got the, the customers. They've got the right of way on the street. They've got the financing method to basically, and I feel I can say that in this situation, socialize the cost <laughs> uh, across all of us in over decades. Uh, and they know how to how to pump energy through the ground. This is this is their their ball field, right? So um, what's wonderful about this system is it's extraordinarily efficient. We all know ground source heat pumps, which is what this is. It's a network ground source heat pump system, are efficient because the temperature in the ground is always the same, right? So it's always you know the heat pumps are always happy and working at their greatest efficiency. But if you networked the ground source heat pumps together as you do in the system, then you get other synergies. So for instance, imagine this is an office building. Uh, it's pulling cooling all the way through the year. Office buildings do that. And therefore it's returning the water a little hotter into the system, allowing other customers down the street to take that heat. So you, you do energy sharing between the buildings. And then also you can store thermal energy uh, so you can store temperature in the bedrock in the summer and then pull it out, pull that heat out in the winter when you need it. Um, and the, also the water in the system is a giant thermal battery, right? You can store an enormous amount of energy there. So if gas utilities did this, then we could uh, transition whole streets at a time, right? We're no longer going building by building. We're then going street by street and if that happens, then all the, uh, then if they're in the same customer rate payer base, the same pile of customers all paying for the infrastructure together, then you always maintain that customer to infrastructure ratio and you avoid that last grandma problem. Um, so the other outcomes is that it's safer because it doesn't have gas in the, in the system, right? Nothing explosive. Uh, it's more, you know, all the predictions are that it will be more affordable. It'll have a lower, uh, you know, heating bill. And uh, there would be lower electricity peaks because uh, this system is the most efficient heating system known. Um, it's, it's about twice as efficient. As you can see here, these are graphs of the electric need of an air source heat pump on the left through the year going from January to December. And then on the right, it's for ground source heat pumps in blue. And so uh, networked ground source heat pumps or thermal networks would be even more efficient than the ground source heat pump shown here. Um, we also know it's reliable. There's installations all across the, the country and uh, you know in very hot areas and in very cold areas. This is an installation in Toronto um, where you can see all those little dots along what looks like the street, those are boreholes in the street. Um, so, and Toronto's cold. So uh, the other great thing is that the gas workers can transition easily because the pipes are the same kind of pipes, uh, exactly the same. The only difference 
is that the uh, pipes, one, you know, the gas pipes have a yellow stripe, <laughs> the water pipes have a blue stripe. So the gas workers are currently certified to operate and maintain the system. And I don't know if any of you worked on uh, the gas bands here in Cambridge, but uh, I was at the first gas ban meeting for the city council, and there were like 50 <laughs> gas workers there, all really, really angry, ready to fight this tooth and nail, the idea of a gas ban. But this, this idea of transitioning to, to networked, you know, ground source heat pumps or thermal networks, um, they don't fight. The, the head of the steel workers uh, has uh, given, you know, said to me that he's worked on gas pipes his whole life and he hopes he gets to work on, on thermal networks. Um, and of course the emissions would be lower because the only emissions associated with this would be the fuel mix for the electricity used. And so given our current fuel mix in this area, the, you'd reduce your emissions in comparison to gas 60% immediately, and those uh, emissions would go down further as you, as our electric grid mixture, fuel mixture goes towards, you know, more renewables. Uh, so I'm thrilled to say <laughs> that there, there's uh, installations that the gas utilities are now doing installations of the, exactly the system. Uh, the Framingham install, it's about 140 units. A uh, firehouse, a uh, uh, part of a public school, strangely a gas station, um, <laughs> some low-income homes, some market-rate homes, etc. Um, that's going to be turned on in just the next few weeks. Yeah, and um, and National Grid has two installation sites that they've already selected. And uh, they will be actually taking, with permission of the customers, all of the gas appliances in those buildings out and replacing them with electric appliances. So that will be a gas utility electrifying, uh, trying that out. And uh, there's one site's in Lowell and the other site's in uh, the Boston Housing Authority in Dorchester. Uh, so they'll be you know, uh, the Boston Housing Authority is all affordable housing. It's 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 just really exciting. Um, and uh, we have, HEAT has a research team with uh, two national labs and a host of other people <laughs> where we're gonna be studying those first few installations because we believe that if we don't share as much uh, information as possible uh, and make it open for everybody to look at, so open public database, of the uh, normalized data, if we don't share those best practices, if we don't, you know, like verify the results in with lots of different people, uh, we will, you know, and show the scaled up impacts, et cetera, and investigate it in every possible way. If we don't do that, people won't trust it and they won't know how to move forward to scale this and optimize it in the best possible ways wherever it is worthwhile. So um, there's a lot of feasibility studies that are being done. Uh, the Department of Energy has uh, paid for a lot of them. They're across the country. Uh, there's over 20 different gas utilities now interested in this concept. They're meeting regularly. They represent over 50% of all the gas customers in the country. And uh, there's legislation uh, that's beginning to, to happen across the country also allowing utilities to go forward this way. Uh, so for instance, in New York, uh, the Utility Thermal Network and Jobs Act was passed in just two months because it was pushed by utilities, environmentalists, and unions. Um, and so New York is, has all these different installations that are waiting for approval right now with the, their public utility commission. So my hope is, is if we manage to you know, pass legislation uh, in Massachusetts and other places that allow gas utilities to do this and maybe even mandate and incentivize them <laughs> to do so, then if your local gas utility, whenever this, this happens to you, they come down your street, they rip up your infrastructure, that they'll be doing so in order to install uh, more affordable, safer, non-emitting, non-combusting renewable thermal energy to provide heating and cooling to you and your children and grandchildren 
that infrastructure that your children and grandchildren will be able to use even as they have to pay for it. Um, and I think that is it. Um, so. Like these, for the Zoom or these, these are these for, the for you, if, or I can give this to you, but I need to introduce you first. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. That was very um, exciting. And um, we've heard from Patty that, uh, you know, she's trying to join us, but she, she, she might not be able to, she, something, something has come up for her, but we're still hoping. Uh, so let me introduce Representative Owen. Um, Owens. Uh, so, State Representative Steve Owens, uh, a Democrat from Watertown, represents the 29th Middlesex District, consisting of sections of Watertown and North and West Cambridge. Representative Owens serves as the House Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Emergency Preparedness and Management, as well as the House Chair of the Clean Energy Legislative Caucus. He's a member of the Committees on Telecommunications, Utilities and Energy, financial services, global warming and climate change, and steering policy and scheduling. Thank you, Rep. Owens. Do you want to use this one? You prefer? Uh, well, the, can, 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 can folks hear me if, I, if I'm not holding the microphone? You can hear me OK? All right, and the Zoom can hear me OK? All right, well, somebody will let me know if they can. <laughs> um, so thank you so much uh, for that. And thank you, um, thank you to Cambridge Mothers out front. Gosh, um, so uh, as Elena said, I'm on the, the um, Joint Committee on uh, Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy, uh, and I go to most of those hearings. And uh, a lot of the climate uh, legislation that comes through the the, the legislature is um, uh, goes through that committee. And when the mothers out front show up, they show up, and they are out front, and they are right in the audience. And I'm always I always know that the, I'm in the right room uh, when I, I'm here with the the, the uh, Cambridge mothers out front. And the the list of folks on the back of this program. You know, I wasn't sure I'd be able to get uh, get here tonight, but I, I can tell I came to the right place uh, seeing seeing the list of uh, sponsors of this event. Uh, I know I'm in, in good company. So thank you. Uh, thank you to Audrey. Um, I got involved in this actually, uh, so I'm in my second term, halfway through my second term. Uh, I got involved in this because uh, Zainab, who is uh, Audrey's partner at HEAT, uh, is uh, is a constituent. She lives over on, on Huron Ave. And, um, Oh, here we go. Uh, just about a few weeks, maybe after my after my election, I get this call uh, a call from Zainab, and uh, she says she's from Heat and um, wants to talk to me about an idea that they they're working on for uh, for reducing uh, reducing carbon emissions. And I said, great. Uh, and she tells me, well, I got a little PowerPoint I want to walk you through. It's about an hour and a half, and it gets really in the weeds. And I was like, okay. <laughs> So you guys, you guys got the, uh, the the much more refined version of this uh, uh, of this today. Um, but uh, ever since then, I've been just such a big fan of the work that Heat's doing and of uh, of the, the network geothermal projects uh, in particular. Um, and that's how I came to be the the uh, house sponsor of the the future of clean heat bill uh, with with Um so I'm the, the, the lead sponsor of the uh, bill. It's H3203 uh, with uh, Representative uh, Jenny Armini, who uh, is from Marblehead. She took over from Rep. Lori Ehrlich, who was uh, very in, uh, involved in the, uh, the gas leaks and um, natural, moving off of natural gas uh, as well. Uh, in the Senate, uh, the Senate sponsor is uh, Senator Cream, uh, who has just uh, done a great job on, on a lot of these um, uh, environmental and decarbonization bills. Uh, seems like every bill that uh, I have is, is either uh, one of hers uh, on the Senate side. So uh, in the climate roadmap bill that we passed in, in, in 2021, um, remember, I want everybody to remember uh, that the House and the Senate passed it in 2020 and uh, Charlie Baker vetoed it the first time before we sent it back to him in May of 2021. So just remember that when you have, if you have any fuzzy memories of Charlie Baker, I don't know if anybody does anymore, <laughs> Just remember that he vetoed it for the, the, the first time. Um, there's a lot of other things, that, uh, but, but you know, we're among friends. Uh, so, so in that bill, uh, uh, the, the Commonwealth uh, committed to reduce the statewide greenhouse gases to net zero by 2050 
um, uh, with sector-based interim targets, right? So generation, transportation, buildings, uh, and then those targets, you know, by 33% uh, by 2025, and then a half by, by 2030, and then so on and so forth. And we kind of know some, how to do some of that, right? We kind of know how to decarbonize transportation. It's going to be some combination of electric vehicles and transit and land use, uh, things like that. We can kind of see a path. Maybe it'll be difficult. Maybe we'll, you know, there'll be, there's certainly going to be hiccups along the way, but you kind of see a path to that, right? We kind of know how to uh, decarbonize electricity generation, right? Some combination of solar and wind and conservation and nuclear. I probably shouldn't say that in front of all of you, but maybe we, we, we use it now. We probably will need it for, um, for the future. Um, but we don't really have a good sense of how to decarbonize our buildings, our, the heat that, that keeps us warm inside. Um, there's no magic wand other than converting things, doing the hard work of converting house by house, building by building, house by house, building by building. And what is that going to take? That's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money. And there's no path to do it that includes business as usual for gas companies, right? We need to get off burning fuels for heat uh, and move on to non-combusting sources of thermal energy. So electricity, right? And that electricity, again, has to be part of this generation that's wind and solar and and, and not battery storage and non-emitting sources. Um, and the, we have to be also careful about the electricity, right? Not only does it not have to be non-emitting sources, but we want to use the best technology. Um, if we move everybody off to, you know, let's say, baseboard uh, resist, electric resistance heaters, um, we will need so much new electricity generating infrastructure to, to, uh, to support that. We, we, it just would be impossible. And that's where things like the, the network ground source heat pumps come in. These are 50% are more efficient than, than electric resistance, you'd say? Yeah, Maybe it's, even it's, more? It's, it's twice as much. Twice as much. So oh, that, that, that sounds better. It's twice as better rather than 50%. <laughs> um, so and then meanwhile, of course, we're spending money replacing in infrastructure that we have already decided due to these, uh, due to these targets. That, we're gonna, that is going to be obsolete. And that was, thank you, Audrey, for the, 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 the last grandma uh, slide. I, I always appreciate watching them go, watching the <laughs> houses go off, off gas one, one by one. Um, so the idea that the future of clean heat bill is, uh, is to set out just a comprehensive, detailed strategy uh, for the transition from non, uh, to non-emitting renewable sources of thermal energy uh, to heat and cool our buildings uh, over the next uh, 25 years up in, uh, into in, and for the future. Um, so what does it do? Well, it, it empowers the DPU to establish the regulatory structure, uh, and the DPU is the Department of Public Utilities. They are the overseeing authority uh, for for the utilities and taxis uh, and um, and the, the safety on the T, as we found out. Um, so uh, yeah, so it. It, it establishes the, the structure to let gas companies evolve in, into thermal energy companies. So rather than saying, I'm a gas company, I can give you gas and I can do nothing else, allowing these gas companies to turn into thermal utilities. So I'm allowed to figure out how best to serve you thermal energy, how best to heat your home. And that includes things like, like network geothermal or even air source heat pumps or any, any solution that makes sense uh, for a uh, for a customer, so they can they would be able to sell non emitting uh, non emitting renewable thermal energy and install that uh, that needed infrastructure. So this is similar to what's happening in Lowell, right? They're replacing your old gas appliances in in Lowell with uh, with you know I, I don't know exactly induction stoves and and electric whatever things. electric appliances <laughs> you you may have to get off of uh, to get to get off of gas. Um, it mandates that the companies, they create plans to transition their infrastructure uh, to non-combusting thermal energy. Um, we, in the last climate bill, mandated that all of the utilities come up with a electrification plan, right? This, this plan, how much electricity are we going to need to generate? How many new substations? How many new, um, you know, uh, uh, 
generating equipment are we going to are we going to actually need? Um, so this does similar for gas. It says how are you going to get off of how are you going to get off of gas? You need to come up with a plan. You need to give us a plan. You need to think further than you know your next quarter's earnings call, right? You need to make sure that you are thinking about 2050 rather than you know what what the stock price is. So the other things that it does is um, it provides funds from Mass Save for a little surcharge um, to, uh, to use to replace gas appliances for weatherization. Um, it prevents them from depreciating gas infrastructure uh, past 2050. So when we're in 2097, uh, we're not, <laughs> we've, they're not continuing uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, service that stuff. Or they don't have it on their books anymore, I should say. So, um, that's, that's the bill. The bill is to enable this um, transition to, you know, I don't want to say put, my, put your thumb on the scale for, for network geothermal, but uh, we want to make sure that the most, efficient, um, the most efficient heating is being used. Right now, that's what it seems to be. We're really excited about these, uh, about these, these pilot programs. Uh, I didn't realize it was about to uh, turn the switch in Framingham. That's amazing. Um, but you know, this is as much uh, as much as a technical problem. It is a, a political uh, one as well. And I think um, folks wanted to know uh, kind of where we're at uh, right now in the legislative process. So um, I was really excited to hear that New York passed their bill in two months. Um, uh, that was uh, uh, stunning. If I. <laughs> Not going to say it didn't make me a little jealous. Um, you know, I grew up in Albany, so I'm like, all of a sudden I started to think, could I go back? But, uh, but no. Uh, I, uh, so so uh, right, right now, the, the, in general, what happens, for those of you who, who don't know the, the, the legislative process, right? Bills get filed. Uh, this bill got filed last year in February, uh, from January, February of last year. Um, it had its bill hearing. Thank you so much to the, the, the folks who came out to support uh, Future of Clean Heat in that hearing. Uh, it was a, a packed room uh, in Gardner Auditorium. Uh, it was a great, uh, a great day and a great um, uh, hearing for the bill. Um, all of the bills that were before TUE were either uh, moved out or extended um, in February. Um, the Future of Clean Heat bill, along with, I think, 20... 20 some odd or uh, 30 some odd uh, bills were moved to the moved to the Senate. So the Senate has uh, with with Senator Cream has the future of clean heat bill in total. Um, and my understanding is that the Senate is uh, working on their own climate bill in the House. Uh, the House uh, telecommunications uh, utilities and energy uh, members reported out five uh, five smaller bills, well, they're all very big, but they're five, and they're part of one large, five bills, um, one bill uh, dealing with building decarbonization, one dealing with uh, power generation, which has, um, I'll talk a little bit about these, but um, I'll get back to the building decarbonization um, at the end. Uh, one is on clean power generation, it has more support for solar, it has a bill that I filed around um, updating the, um, updating the SMART program uh, in it. Um, it uh, has some things around hydro uh, and storage. Uh, there's a bill uh, on siting and permitting uh, aimed at uh, reducing some bottlenecks to build new clean energy generation and to build out the power grid. Um, and one bill that doesn't apply so much in Cambridge, but for the folks, I, uh, but for the folks who are uh, interested in this, um, Cambridge has been a municipal uh, aggregation program for electricity. Watertown does as well. Um, there are some communities that have been trying to do this for months, years, and the DPU had not approved their, uh, their programs for whatever reason. Um, so there's a bill now that has been reported out that sets a 90-day deadline. So um, those folks that don't have, um, uh, that, are in, that are working on those programs are very excited about that. So anyway, um, I, we did manage to get in that building decarbonization package. Um, 
some transportation uh, provisions as, uh, as well, uh, but also several uh, provisions that originated in the future of clean heat. Um, and those are, um, there is the, the change to the franchise is now in that uh, House Climate Bill. Um, and that's, uh, that's the one that says, all right, you no longer have to be just a gas company, you can be a thermal energy company, you can do this by right, you don't have to apply to the DPU for an exception every single time. Um, and that's really kind of the core of what we want to do, is we want to make sure we are, we are bringing these companies in to help us with the transition rather than wrestling them uh, along the way the whole time. So I'm really excited. Uh, it looks like, you know, n nothing's ever guaranteed in this business, but it looks like we will have a, a, another climate bill, which means, you know, one climate bill a session uh, for the past three sessions, which is really exciting. Um, so, and there's not. <laughs> so I, I and I, I really want to thank you know I want to thank the, uh, the the particularly you know I'm on the house side so the house leadership for making sure that that uh, that house is, uh, that that we have been prioritizing you know uh, climate um, on our side. I know that. Um, We've got that. We got staff from uh, from Rep Decker and, and Senator Di Domenico's office here as well, and they have been just tremendous partners, uh, great champions uh, for the environment, and so many other things. Uh, so uh, I, I, I appreciate the work of the. We don't always say we appreciate the work of the staff, but I know as somebody who's relatively new to this business, I appreciate the work of the staff because uh, I could not do it uh, uh, without, and I'm sure that. Uh, my colleagues would, would would agree. So um, I did get I did see I got the I got the red. So I I, I will uh, I'll, I'll pass on to to leave some leave some time for other folks. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Owens, for that overview. Um, we're particularly excited about the franchise provision uh, being in the in the House bill. Um, and now let's move on to our own uh, local uh, Patty. <laughs> Patty Nolan has been involved in environmental activism for decades and sees the climate crisis as the issue of our times. She previously led an environmental company and was vice president of a New England business group for social impact. In her tenure on the Cambridge School Committee, she championed many initiatives, including several on environmental sustainability. In her service on the City Council, her main focus is on how the city as a whole can achieve its climate goals. Here you go, Patty. Right, so I have just a few minutes because we're really here to hear about this transition, but I think it's really important to bring it to the local. Most of you, are you, how many of you are from Cambridge? Yay! <laughs> so I love working for you. And, and you can be proud, all of you in Mothers Out Front and 350 know, we passed some really great stuff the last term. To the question of building decarbonization, Cambridge, to remind us all, the reason we focused so much on it and so many emails that you all flung at us and meetings that you set up were about buildings is because 80% of our emission pollution in Cambridge is from buildings. That's not true nationwide. Nationwide, it's only about 40%. Part of that is because we don't drive as much and we're more um, urban focus, but still, that means for us to address our emission pollution, I never say, I try not to say emission without pollution because emission seems antiseptic, but it's emission pollution. It's clear that it's a real, and it's a public health threat as well. So just very quickly, um, let's see a couple of things. We have several ground source heat exchange buildings. Again, all of us can be proud. We started out with one of the first, the City Hall Annex, and frankly, it had problems. It was one of the first ground source heat exchange buildings, and there were people who worked there say it took us a long time. Yeah, that was 20 years ago. It's just like if you had the first LED or the first CFL, it was not as good as the ones now, which are completely transformed. Our last two school buildings, just like Watertown, we have to give props to Watertown as well, have ground source heat exchange and are very, very close to net zero. It's, so it's not an entire campus, but it's a very large building whose primary source of heating and cooling is a, is a, a networked, is, is a ground source heat exchange series of pipes. I think what's really important for us, for you all to know, is we are working and trying to get that Buto implementation, which we all worked hard on. If we don't implement it well, it's not gonna be something that other cities will follow. 
And so just this week, the council passed a policy order I authored with several of my colleagues to say, all right, we knew when we passed this requirement that large buildings get to net zero by 2035, and there was a lot of pushback. We had to push back on very large institutions, looking at you, Harvard and MIT, <laughs> who said, oh, 2035, that's really too early. It's like, really, have you read your website? <laughs> You're supposed to be climbing, not to be too snarky, but I'm a little snarky. But really, it was so frustrating for all of us to see them. But we did pass it because of all of you. But we have to implement it now really well. So now the policy order was, OK, let's get to the technical assistance and the funding to help the medium-sized property owners to actually implement. What's really exciting, which if you don't know, it's actually news. I just found out a couple of days ago. The Climate Crisis Working Group, which Marjorie Davis and Audrey Shulman were on, one of the things we looked at was, hey, can we please do net, some network geothermal here in Cambridge? And there had been a grant that the city applied for from the federal government that we did not get. So we put in a policy order to say, can we do this? That was a year and a half ago. Nothing's happened. But I'm proud to say right now, the city is in the process of issuing an RFP for a feasibility study for a network geothermal project as a pilot in the west side of Cambridge, right around the Haggerty School, which has low-income housing, institution, uh, uh, single-family homes, and some uh, commercial. So it would be so exciting. Now, it's only a feasibility study, but I got to say, that's the kind of news that would not have happened if Audrey, hadn't, Audrey and team had not started HEAT, and the state had not passed a bunch of stuff to say, yes, we need to do this. And if all the advocates from Mothers Out Front 315 in Green Cambridge had not come to us and said, how can we be leaders if we're not doing this? I've pushed for it, you've pushed for it. And I haven't seen the RFP, so I don't know, but I have been assured it is in the process of being developed and will be established and set out, which means we will be doing a feasibility study for network geothermal right here in our city, which is very exciting. <laughs> right here in Steve's district, yes. Um, so, so I don't have much more to add because I know this is on getting off gas. Although there is one other thing to add, which is the city is also working really hard on what's called a virtual PPA, which is a power purchase agreement, which honestly is a little bit like a shell game. Like Rex are a little bit of a shell game, but it's better than just like buying credits at a, sorry, like a rainforest in Indonesia, right, for a forest, which likely is going to be just cut down in five years and you're never going to know. So what we're doing as a city for our municipal aggregation is having a, we are investing in an out of state wind farm or solar farm, which wouldn't be built otherwise. And then we will be using that basically to generate in essence through a trade agreement, the power that all of us who are on the city's aggregation program use. So that's another way that we're transitioning off gas because if we can get just a renewable energy electricity, about half of the emission pollution in our buildings in Cambridge, are just the electricity generation. So if that's all, you've already uh, decreased your emission pollution by 50% if you have clean energy. So that's uh, some of the things we're working on. Okay, well. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Patty, for sharing some, some good Cambridge news. Uh, that's all uh, very exciting. So I wanted to take a moment to thank um, some legislators, staff who are here with us tonight, especially Ellie Fenichel, staff for Senator Saldi Domenico, thank you for being with us, and Maggie Peterson, staff for Marjorie Decker, thank you both for being here, and there may be more um, who joined us on, on Zoom, so we would like to thank them uh, as well. Uh, so now, let's move on to Q&A. Uh, Cynthia here will be passing the microphone around. Please um, raise your hand uh, to indicate that you have a question. Uh, stand up if you can and identify yourself. Please keep your questions short and make sure that they end with a question mark. Thank you. <laughs> OK, I see one a hand over here. Yes? My name is Ralph Boynton. I'm a homeowner down in Market Street. Um, the building department is going to have to get interest, involved in this extensively. To what extent have they been alerted to the fact that Cambridge is geothermal friendly? Because I had considered doing geothermal on my property and they don't seem thoroughly clued in. And I was wondering to what extent if I do a private 
geothermal setup that could be hooked into a public one later. Is that for me, partly? Yes. Yeah. Um, I bet Audrey could answer the question about linking it to a, a layer. Mm -hmm. I agree. What's um, the good news is our inspectional services department in the building have gotten the message they have to be training people, and they are. So we have both the specialized stretch code, which means buildings have to be better than they are from an energy efficiency point of view. I'm a little bit fat, uh, simplistic on it, but it, we passed that. We also have the fossil fuel free demonstration. They are having a seminar with their inspectors once a week for an hour each time to make sure the inspectors and the building people know about these new ordinances. I mean, if you, if you go to build a building, you have to follow this. On um, the geothermal, I think that's a really good question. I, I think we know about it, but I would bet there's some inspectors who don't know. And if you want to talk to someone who did it, talk to Sue Butler. It's the only individual home I know of in Cambridge that actually did a ground source heat exchange, drilling her wells in her, she's lived on Clinton Street. We're happy to connect you with her. Um, and what, what's, what's interesting is there's a listserv called Zero Carbon Massachusetts, which has done phenomenal work. Lisa Cunningham, I think. Um, and I found out through them, gee, Arlington, Brookline, and Lexington have this joint website for the fossil fuel free demonstration other, and our website is not so great. Like, I went to look something up, it's like, I, you know, I have a master's degree, and I am really familiar with the city website, and I'm not sure where the information is, so that's a problem. Anyway, they are now connected. I connected them with those people, and we're probably going to have a much more user-friendly website. So that, does that answer your question? So I will find out if we know more, but I'll raise that and let the building inspector know they're very open to this and want to do the right thing to say this is something they need to train their people on. That would be a great idea. And you know what? It's one of the things we, we the Climate Crisis Working Group, had, had set aside $2.5 million in the ARPA funding, which is this federal funding you can use for a range of things that you can't use real tax dollars. Oh, Cynthia was on the CCWG also. Um, anyway, I don't think that has been spent. And one of the things I've said is, can we pay people to put in induction stoves or do so? You know, I'm not sure where it's going, but that would be an idea that we should particularly re reduce the fees because those are fees that we charge. We should be incentivized. I don't know. Do you know the question about the networking? Like, yeah, are you so saying if you did it, can you then later on? I, I feel like everybody should be able to be uh, prosumers on the system. So uh, that if you have boreholes, you know, already uh, underneath your building, you should be able to sell that thermal energy. Or if you own an ice rink, you should be able to sell the heating that you're creating or moving by taking all the cooling off the water, right? So we should all, so that would incentivize lots of people to move forward quickly along with the utilities. Um, I, I think that would be uh, amazing and developers would begin to get interested, et cetera. Can we do that now, do you know? Uh, I think that the, we, uh, it's gonna take the Department of Public Utilities and others to figure it all out. Um, so there might be a, a little bit that you can get ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, start, start the thermal marketplace now. Great, other questions? Yeah, my name's Jonathan Harris. Um, I have a question about the network geothermal. I understand how that would work with new construction and institutional. But suppose it's a street, like the street Audrey showed, where they're replacing the gas pipes and they're going to network geothermal instead. Then they have to have buy-in from everyone on the street, right? And a way of replacing their gas appliances and their gas heating system. How does that work? So um, it, it could happen many ways. So for instance, Eversource in Framingham, what they did was they took, and everybody can hear me OK, right? If anybody, OK. Um, they uh, retrained their gas uh, salesmen in two hours and sent them out to ask customers along the projected pathway if they wanted to connect in. Uh, and every single person they talked to uh, said yes, except for one person who uh, had just replaced their HVAC. So, but it was o only voluntary, only customers who wanted. So they can install the infrastructure and then as people want, they can interconnect. Um, and same thing in Lowell and in, in Dorchester, right? It's voluntary. It's possible 
that as the gas system, which has to be more right-sized for our future gas use, as it becomes right-sized, you know, for instance, my street could have, they could have taken that gas pipe and replaced it with a thermal network. And then you would have the choice, interconnect to the thermal network um, or go to fuel oil or, or, you know, air force heat pumps or whatever. But the, the thermal network should be, you know, lower cost than anything else. Uh, and provide cooling, you know, et cetera. So I think under those circumstances, yeah, most people would be like, yo, yes, <laughs> which is the same thing that happened in Framingham. But what about the upfront cost to the homeowner for installing the heat pumps, for changing their gas stove, for an induction electric stove, et cetera? Is there any financial support for that? How does that work? So we are all going to have to retrofit all of our buildings, right, uh, to something in order to re uh, decarbonize our buildings. And that's true also with thermal networks. Currently with the, the, the demonstration installations by the utilities, those are being paid for by the utilities and thus ultimately by all the rate payers, all the gas customers. Um, in the future, uh, past these demonstration installations, my hope, is that it'll be partly mass save uh, as well as partly the electric utilities because they currently are gonna have to totally upgrade their entire electric system as well as put in an enormous no amount of substations, get a lot of renewable energy, a lot of storage, get some transmission lines in, et cetera, in order for all of us to move to electricity. And this system instead would lower that electric peak, as well as all of the cost of all of that infrastructure quite considerably. So it might be cheaper for the electric utilities to pay for your customer retrofit than it would be for them to try to site another substation in your neighborhood. My, you know, and there's a variety of other ways, but I, I think we're going to have to pay for those customer retrofits and do it in an equitable way uh, and fast if we want to do all that we need to do. And you know, just to just to follow up on that, I think there's there's a you know for buildings, the only solution that we have now come up with is pay people to make the transition or wait for somebody to wait for somebody's furnace to uh, to, to die and then say, Oh by the way, this is gonna end up being being cheaper if you retrofit. It, it, there's so we if we're going to hit our our 2050 targets um we're gonna we're gonna need to help people along because there's pe people are not going to be able to do these tr transitions i mean maybe maybe many of us here you know in cambridge and watertown will be able to you know foot, foot our own bills or with mass save or with re credits or rebates and the ira fund funding coming in from the feds and be able to cobble something together but there's a lot of people that aren't going to be able to do that and 2050 net zero is everybody, right? So we are going to need to help people along, and we kind we have this understanding of that, um, you know. So, you know, is there a giant pot of money right now to do everybody right now? No, but if we're com really committed to this, we know it's going to take, you know, you know, billions of dollars with a B um, to 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 get to get this done, and people are going to need help. There was a question over here. Um, my question is, I, my understanding is, is that the gas companies have done topographical analysis of the state. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, because my understanding is that um, geothermal won't work everywhere. And again, I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> But is there a good understanding of where things could be converted and maybe where things can't? Um, so uh, HEAT has done a, a statewide feasibility study okay. with Borough Happold Engineering, and it's available on our website in the library. Um, and that shows uh, roughly where we can uh, meet uh, the, the heat, the, you know, the total heating and cooling need of that type of of build, you know, that type of neighborhood. Um, and it's, uh, you know, basically matches most of the gas uh, territory. 
So most of where there is gas territory, we would uh, be able to, according to this feasibility study, uh, likely be able to meet all the heating and cooling needs. Um, and there certainly will be some places where, you know, there's hazardous waste underneath the street, or <laughs> it's, it's going to be, you know, just financially not viable for one reason or another to do that. Let's do air source heat pumps there. Let's, let's do other methods. Uh, th thermal networks or networked geothermal is not the answer for everywhere. We will know as this goes on how, how much it can meet, but I believe it'll be a large percentage. And, and it, so it sounds like the gas companies have that basic data that they would need to make their plans. Um, they uh, probably haven't put it all together. Okay. I think they should take the gas pipe replacement data and the electric constraint data and the uh, mass uh, bore, in the Massachusetts borehole, you know, data that's already existing and the energy use intensity and the, like they, they, they you know, you want to map a lot of stuff yeah. and then come up with a good algorithm. And the, and the legislation gives them a time where they have to come up with those plans. Is that it? The legislation mandates that they have to provide that they have to start working on those plans. That they have to update them regularly. That they have to provide all of the gas pipe replacement uh, information for across the entire state. So everybody who is on a leak-prone infrastructure would know it. And they would know when the gas utility approximately is going to replace that pipe, and then you can, you know, you can start pushing <laughs> to make sure that that's replaced the way you want it. Right. Uh, and there'd be lots of other things. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, okay. and and just a, along the lines of those plans, um, the DPU back in December basically, without the legislation, told all the utilities, "You better have this. You, you know, we're expecting you to have this plan uh, to decarbonize." So the DPU kind of on its own, you know, said. You know, we want you to have these plants now, it, and, and and that has, you know, they have to do it. Um, you know, the next administration, the next DPU could say, oh, by the way, we don't care about that because it's not, you know, it's not in law, but, you know, for now, that's what they have to do, and, and we're expecting that they will. They will. My name's Arthur McHugh, and I live on William Street. You said that the only difference between the pipes was one's got a blue line and one's got a yellow line. Does that mean that if they put in new gas lines, those same pipes could then be used for the geothermal stuff? They don't have to be, they're not orphan pipes. Um, it's, we, in our conservative analysis, we always make the assumption that no current gas infrastructure would be reused because we want to make sure that even if every pipe was replaced, it's still financially viable and worthwhile. It is possible that some of those gas pipes will be able to be reused. Well, if they're the same pipes, why couldn't they be? Uh, they might be a different diameter, right? And gas might have, uh, you know, has a higher energy density than water. Um, and uh, they also, you'd want to uh, uh, attach to them. So you'd need to stub out and attach yeah, boreholes. Yeah. And, you know, there's a variety of other things. So. Yeah, it's Thank possible, you. but we don't know how much. Thanks. S Cynthia, there's a, there's a, Cynthia, there's a question also up, up here later. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Kathy Zussi from Hamilton Street. Um, Audrey, you're so convincing. Um, uh, so what outside of inertia is holding us back from adopting this quickly? I realize regulations need to change. I realize that we need to have transitions. But um, uh, what, are th are, what are the drawbacks? I mean, the only things I've heard that are negative about heat pumps is that they can be really noisy if they're old. I've heard that sometimes heat pump systems Money. don't get really warm on cold days. What, what are the arguments against this wonderful system? Um, so uh, with uh, networked geothermal, it would be quieter than air source heat pumps, it's, it's because you, you, the, the noise tends to come from the compressors outside and there wouldn't be compressors outside, right? Um, the, and because you're pulling temperature from the, the ground, it's, uh, you know, it's always, you know, a few feet down, it's always 55 degrees in this area. Uh, so that's the kind of temperature that keeps heat pumps constantly working at their greatest efficiency and perfectly happy. So it could be zero degrees outside, 
but you're still able to access that 55 degree temperature. So it's always, you know, you can always provide the temperature you need. Um, and uh, so in terms of the arguments against, can, you know, should gas utilities be, be given this right, right? Um, should, uh, um, what else? It might cost a lot, right? How are we gonna pay for those customer retrofits? Um, you, you, you can come up with a lot of different arguments, but I believe that like we did in that beginning, where we began to try to think about what the future is we want. I believe we, have, we want a future where everybody is able to get off of gas and that the gas workers can continue to have good livable jobs and be able to provide for their families and that we do this in an equitable and ridiculously fast way. <laughs> and so given those things, uh, I think we just have to continue to explore this this way forward to find out how much of an answer it can provide. Yeah, and, and let's not discount the power of inertia, right? I mean, the gas comp asking the gas company, the gas utilities of all people, to do something different than they've done for for you know, the thou past thousands of years that they've been uh, uh, claiming to do this stuff. I mean, that that was a, that. Uh, that pipe from Boston was from the Lincoln administration. Yep. So we're really, you know, we're we're really asking them to 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 take a, a, a leap here, and um, you know, so overcoming that inertia is actually, you know, is is quite difficult to get them to do something different than what they're what they're doing. Even as on their websites and on, on all their, you know, they they will say, oh, well, we're trying to be more green. We're trying to be more. Really, what they want is they want to sell you. They want to sell you gas or they want to build more gas pipes. I, I yeah. had a conversation with somebody at National Grid and I swear you could have thought they, that their job was pipe construction rather than supplying natural gas. They were so really, really focused on, 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 on pipe construction. So, um, so that, that's the, the, the inertia is, is a real, is, is real. It's not just, you know, something that we can, we can wave away because uh, we need to convince the, the people who, should be doing this to, to do it, or at least to stop doing what they're doing. Um, if we leave them to their own devices, they're gonna find some way to blend something in with this gas that will allow them to say, well, it's a little bit less carbon intensive. Uh, well, we've added something to this gas to make it, you know, we've made it more natural than the natural gas it is, because it now it's biogas, so it's fine. I don't worry about it. Um, that's what they're gonna wanna do, because they're gonna wanna keep doing what they're doing, um, uh, rather than change their business model. And you, on some level, you can't blame them. I mean, I don't know how many of you own businesses, but if somebody comes to you and says, you gotta change your business model, your first instinct is gonna be like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> so, um, uh, but, and, but. And, and for every time someone says, oh my God, those heat pumps can't work in New England winter, you have to say, yeah, that might've been true 10 years ago. <laughs> it's not true today. Yeah. And did you hear about the houses that were blown up by gas lines in Lowell? Yeah. And do you right. know that there's towns, what was the name of the town where there was a gas spill recently? I mean, that's the counter. We have to really actively counter that to say, yeah, it's a change, but it's a positive change. There was somebody over here. Do you mind you asked my question? Wait, like, hold on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sure, Nancy Kilburn, I'm from First Church Cambridge and Mass General Hospital too. Um, and I was kind of gonna ask, so I'm all on board, I'm fully, you know, but what are the, what opposition do people put up for it? Um, and, and what are the talking points? And I feel like Patty, you just gave us an awesome, you know, yeah, bring that up, bring that up. So, and, and kind of what should I do? What can we do? You know, I'll, I'll pass it over here in a second, but I would say first off, <laughs> call your local uh, senator and, uh, you know, uh, and say like, hey, this future of clean heat sounds awesome. Gas utilities should be given the option to evolve or die, right? <laughs> Let them try it. Uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, what, uh, yeah, so, and, you know, I sort of already answered what people could say that could fight about, you know, and say that it's, why people might be against it. What, what else would you yeah, say? Yeah, I mean, re reaching out to your legislator as a legislator, I 
I can tell you that when we get, you know, uh, when we get a couple emails on one thing, we we say okay. When we get, you know, a couple dozen emails on something, we say like, oh, well, now we gotta now we gotta sit back and pay attention. This is uh, particularly in something that is um, very technical like this. Um, I I may not be, you know, if, if Zainab, for example, hadn't called me, you know, three weeks after I got elected, I would be like, future it sounds good to me, but I don't know anything about that, right? So I got sucked in by having one of my constituents uh, be really excited about this and, and really engaged. And I think, you know, if you were to ask some, some other legislators what, why they got involved in one of their bills, uh, it would be very similar. So, you know, uh, that, that I, I'm never going to tell somebody to not contact their, their, their legislator as, as, as somebody who likes to hear from constituents. Um, so I, I would say that. I would say also, you know, to the extent that you can evangelize around uh, around heat pumps and, and decarbonization, as you are all doing as members of, of, of one of these groups, uh, keep at it because it's uh, it's working. It's working. So and I would yeah, add, going to there is a just quick because in Cambridge we have not really established a climate fund to address the level of urgency in the climate emergency. We have exactly that to say. We have gratefully, unbelievably, have $50 million a year we're spending for affordable housing crisis. We are spending maybe $6 million on climate emission reduction pollution. And I feel like it should match both of those because they're urgent and they're actually linked, right? We know environmental justice and public health is, is so I would urge you to contact, as Steve said, contact those legislators, contact the city and say, what are you doing and where's the millions and millions for the climate emergency? And DPU, which is having a public, like they're going on a road show the next week, tell them, let the gas companies do whatever they want, let the aggregation programs go. I can well, let. Don't, don't let them do whatever they want. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> let the gas companies transition. Yeah, yeah, okay. But if people are interested, DPU for the first, I don't know if the first or not, but I can forward to you guys. There's a hearing next week, and it's a road show that they want to hear from the public, and they're pretty important in this. Yeah, okay, we're going to go to some questions on Zoom. Oh, sorry about that. I'll just forward you the email. So one good question from the Zoom chat. Um, how long is this going to take? So how long would this take, for example, for the um, Strawberry Hill Cambridge project that Patty described, which is similar to Framingham, but maybe somewhat smaller? So how long would it take for a neighborhood? How long would it take for all the places in the state which you've described as sort of suitable for geothermal. So how long will this transition take in one neighborhood and then statewide? I mean, one of the things we're trying to do this session is reduce some of the, some of the over, the, like the bureauc bureaucratic overhead. Um, so hopefully the, the amount of bureaucratic overhead uh, will be lessened. But in terms of like how long it actually takes, I mean, Framingham, how long from the first drill till, you know, it, so uh, I think this this first install yeah. <laughs> might not you know it's it's a learning process. The second install was already prepped, you know that, that in Lowell they found the site they got the customer agreements etc about twice as fast. Wow. So I think we're going to go faster and faster as this goes forward. And in terms of the the total speed, I think that depends on how important we find this, how mm -hmm. much we're, how much we're uh, willing. To, to you know how, how hard we're willing to work towards this, but uh, you know my, my hope is uh, over the next 20 years a significant portion of the the gas system will be uh, transitioned this way, and you know the rest will be air force heat pumps and, and other things. And the feasibility study I think is expected to be a few months long, and then if it passes, then it would be on the order of Framingham for a year or two. Yeah. So another question that came in on the chat, um, who's going to be deciding where these uh, neighborhood or, or network geothermal projects go forward? Is it going to be pretty much on the, on the utilities side? Is it going to be Eversource? Who, who's going to pick the sites um, as it rolls out? Um, just last week, uh, the state announced that they'd hired an, uh, some, uh, somebody at the Department of Public Utilities to be responsible for the energy transition. Um, and so, uh, 
I think she, uh, as well as the DO Department of Energy Resources um, and the uh, Secretary of Energy and Environment will be working on that plan uh, with the utilities to figure out how to do this in an integrated street segment based phased way. Um, but uh, those that road show at the Department of Public Utilities, uh, that's a great way to help get your thoughts about this. I think there's one next Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. um, you can sign up to speak. And I, I'm gonna say this is the most exciting moment in energy transition in this country ever, right? We've got both the gas system being rethought as well as the electric system being rethought. And this is the first time that I know of that the Department of Public Utilities, a super secretive organization, <laughs> has ever had a, a road show. And I might be wrong on that, but it's the only one I know of. And so this is a chance to talk to this super secretive, uh, really powerful organization and tell them what's important to you. So uh, please sign up. It, it's probably on their website. And then another question that came in from the chat, actually a couple people asked the same question. So you're someone who's already made the investment on your own in, uh, in air source heat pumps for your house. And this transition comes to your neighborhood. Your neighborhood is slated for network geothermal. Um, what will happen to the pre-existing air source heat pump systems on the house by house basis when mm -hmm. that happens? Um, so you already have the infrastructure in your house. Your house is already retrofitted for heat pumps then. It should be, and most air source heat pumps last about 12 years. Um, so you should be able to uh, fairly soon interconnect um, into, the, into the system. I mean, it would be analogous to like if gas came to your street, right, and you're still on oil, you know, I'm still on oil, but like I can check into the gas system when I, if I needed to, it, the, the, same, it, the same analogy should, should apply. If, the, if Network Geo comes to your street and you've got air source heat pumps and, uh, you know, they, they start to go, you should be able to... to be a lot easier to hook into an existing one than, than one that's um, that's not there. And then an, uh, w one other really comment on the chat, which is um, Audrey should let everybody know that you can indicate interest on the HEAT um, -E website and have oh, that work geothermal um, on, in, your, in your neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can maybe just say a sentence. Yeah, there's a, you can go to, I think it's called Want Geo on the HEAT website and uh, type in your address and it'll put it on a map saying that you want your, you want at oh, your address cool. Want Geo. And our hope is, is to get a lot of people doing that so that the gas utilities, the legislators, et cetera, see that people really want this um, and uh, begin to, to move forward towards it faster because of that. I think, I think maybe I'll, I'll take one more question from the crowd that is here, and then it will be time to wrap up. Someone. Yeah. Ralph Boynton, I've been in the trades for 60 years, and a major obstruction to all of us is going to be the, act, the ability uh, to come up with sufficient workers to make this transition. <coughs> we don't do something to start training people specifically for these jobs now and make it part of a plan, you're never going to get competent installations. By the same token, if we don't have livable housing for these people while they're studying, they're not going to be able to stay in the area and you still won't have competent technicians. And I can see a drain of technicians out of this area, to less expensive areas, we really need to support places like Ringe and so forth, with specific training in this, and I hope the certification isn't too onerous as it is with many of the trades today where you have to spend six years as an apprentice here and go through these hoops and go through those hoops. That's all well and good for getting a competent force, but it sure doesn't speed the process along. So I think the State uh, Representative Owen really needs to get on top of developing the trades that we will need to do this transition or we're going to run into a brick wall. Right now you have a few skilled people doing it, but once it becomes popular, 
the equipment won't be there, the technicians won't be there, and we, the ones we have, we could lose elsewhere. Can I just answer some of that, the implicit question? True, and as Audrey and Steve both know, there was some resistance from a lot of unions to this, right? We're gonna lose our jobs. And I went to some event downtown where there was oh, not quite a picket. And then when we talked to them though, the fact is, is they're still laying pipes. They just didn't realize, you know, it is a job. It's just a different job, but we have to convey that message. But I also know that Rep Decker and Senator Sal de Domenico are huge union supporters. And there's been a number of, in fact, there's a breakfast next week Many of the unions understand this transition and they want good jobs. There's a lot of education to happen and there has to be money put in the training. So I'm, I'm endorsing what you said, but also it is happening already. People understand Cambridge itself. I'm waiting for the green jobs. We passed a green jobs ordinance and we're supposed to have a report on what are we doing to develop the workforce for the, the transition that we have. So it is there, we need to do more, but I know that the legislators are aware that, that we want to work with unions, and the, the but the education is huge, and pairing that with uh, livable wage jobs is is an issue. But it's certainly on the radar. Yeah, and and just to, to piggyback off of that, certainly the the laying the pipe works. I mean that the the training that is available now, the, the steel uh, steel. steel steel workers and the pipe fitters, you know, they know how to do that now. So they they we do have. Um, for the, for the laying of the pipe. What we don't have is we, we don't have enough drillers for the boreholes. That we know, we don't have that, and right? Electricians. We don't have enough, and you know, if anybody's tried to put, uh, has gone to, to um, uh, uh, Mass Save, done an audit and tried to get a heat pump, you're 50% likely to get somebody who's like, I'm not sure heat pumps are good for New England. Like you'll hear that <laughs> from, from, ever, from, a, 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 from Mass Save uh, certified people. So this is a real problem, and the workforce is a problem. And frankly, the workforce is a problem not just for clean, you know, clean energy, the clean energy transition, but for really everything. Everybody I talk to um, is having trouble uh, finding a, a good workforce, whether it's hospitals, um, whether it's um, you know uh, education, whether whether it's the trades. Uh, so this is a real problem, and part of the problem is that, that it's hard for people to live here. It's it's expensive to live here. Um, you know, the governor's got a housing bond bill that the legislature is looking through, and I'm very optimistic about that. That can that can help some of these uh, these, these these problems. Um, but it is, but but workforce is a problem for everybody. Um, you know, the, the chocolate shop down the street that for, from you that closed. When I talked to them a few years ago, they're like, we can't find people. And and what I would tell people is that you know, if the chocolate shop can't find workers, we none of the rest of us have any hope. So. Um, so it is. It is a problem. It's something we're focused on. Um, it's something we're doing a lot of a lot of work. A lot of uh, work, particularly around you know our community colleges, to try to try to get people in to, to, to train for these jobs. Um, and it's definitely on our radar. Okay. So it's time to to wrap up. Um, so I would like to thank our speakers, our audience, both in person and on Zoom our sponsors and co-sponsors and our terrific volunteers that make all of this possible. Um, on your way out, there, there are tables uh, that have materials and volunteers from Mothers Out Front, 350 and other groups. So if you want to learn more, stop uh, and have a chat with them. And uh, you all have a program with QR codes. Use those QR codes to learn more. So thank you everybody for, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, and have a great evening.